our guest speaker. We thought about who could be a good guest speaker for not only, as Luke said, motivational, but inspirational speech. And we came to the conclusion it should be someone from our leadership team, someone with experience, an inspiring, inspiring guy, and we found Jesper. Jesper Eck from the Management Cluster Nordic. He is going to present us the House of Leadership. This is based on a presentation and on work he has been doing for the London Business School, and he has done that in a field trial in Sweden, and it seems to work, and we are going to be really excited to hear you. Jesper, please. Have you ever read Shakespeare? Anyone? Yes. Oh, some of you. You're not lying. I hadn't really until this Christmas when my wonderful wife gave me this book, Henry V. And since it was my wife, I felt, mm, maybe I should read it. And I did. And boy, what a story I discovered. I'm sure that some of you might have heard of it, and if you're English, you might have heard enough of it. But I discovered and learned about a hundred-year war. Actually, in fact, it was 116 years. And I learned of a king named Henry V. And I learned of a place in France called Agincourt. Am I pronouncing that right? Agincourt, thank you. And I learned of a historical battle through Shakespeare, a story told still on theater stages today. On the night of October 24th in the year 1415, no one believed in Henry V camp that they would live to see England again. They were tired from battle. They'd been in France for months trying to chase them to fight them. They were weary from walking and carrying. They were exhausted from lack of sleep and lack of proper food. And they, worst of all, they were really outnumbered. The French army camped only a few miles away, over there, uh, <clears throat> is to believe to have numbered 20,000, if not 30,000. <gasps> all well armed, all well rested, all well trained. Now, Henry V's camp, after months in France, they were numbering tops 6,000. When the dark came, no one spoke. The camp was quiet, and all that could be heard was the distant sound of the French army getting ready for the battle tomorrow. Now, We'll come back to Henry V and that morning of October 25th, but I can see that Marcel is looking a bit puzzled now uh, because clearly this is not the speech he uh, asked me to do. Uh, but I assure you, we'll, we'll see how it fits in in the end. But what I was asked to do here was to come and talk about inspiring leadership and how you as a leader can inspire your team and build what I call a leadership house together with your team. And this leadership house is really a metaphor for a place where people want to go to, not because they have to, but because they want to. My story starts in February of 2012. And at that time, I get a phone call from Olaf Schulzek. And I'm sure that most of you still remember Olaf Schulzek, then head of uh, uh, Northwest Iberia at Diabetes Care. And he calls me up, and we started talking. And you know, after some chit-chats, he asked me, oh, you know, Jesper, uh, I know that you work uh, at uh, Roche Pharma, and you know, you're heading up external affairs there. but..." Um, would you be interested in uh, taking over diabetes care in Sweden? I said, oh, 
you know, that's, that sounds really interesting. And, and I'm sure that some of you know that my, my father used to work here. Uh, and it's one thing with my dad, he's extremely passionate about diabetes care. So, you know, I got interested right away. So I said, okay, well, uh, tell me a little bit more about diabetes care in Sweden. Uh, you know, is there anything special you can share? And he said, well, well, what are you interested in? At that time, I said, well, you know, tell me the business plans. Do you have any business plans? Tell me about that. And uh, so he showed me the business plan of 2011 and 12. Looked like this. Oh, well, well, this is really interesting. Um, so, uh, okay, so things have gone really sort of tough, tough, must be really tough there. Uh, we're now in the middle of that graph. And as you can see, it's continuing to go down. So in 2017, we're going to end up roughly close to 60 from the 240 there. I'd say, okay, tough. So then after a while, we started talking about other things and uh, we came into the team itself. And I said, is there anything with the team that you can share? And then sort of he, uh, he got silent for a while and he said, you know what? The Geos has just arrived. And I said, oh, that's great. Can, it, can you share the Geos results with me? He said, yes, I can. But you know, it, it's not yet official, but I can share it with you. And this is how it looks like. I'm not sure if this is the lowest engagement score of the entire Roche group at that time, but someone in HR told me that it's probably the highest disengagement score <laughs> of any team at that time. Okay, so you had basically, after we were sort of summing up the, the, the phone call, it came to this. So he said, you know, would you be interested to take over uh, DC in Sweden, you know, with low engagement, very high disengagement. You have sales going down and continuing to go down, most likely, according to plans. Your operating profit is going down. Your uh, average selling price is going down uh, as a consequence of, you know, Aviva going down. And to make things even worse, um, we had quite a few of upcoming tenders. In fact, 75% of Sweden were up for tenders. Is any one of you familiar with tenders? Yes. You are. OK, I tell you, this is lesson number one today. Never engaged in tenders. If you can stay out, stay out. But in Sweden, we are not in that situation. Sweden is 100% tender country. So basically, what, what, what I knew was whatever sales were coming in in the end of 2011, with these tenders coming up, we had to compensate the loss in sales. Because what happens in tenders? Is the price going to go up in a tender? Yeah. Very unlikely. Ever. Well, but very unlikely. So most likely it's going to go down. So that means whatever sales you had in 2011, you had to compensate that by more volumes in sales in 2012. And then, you know, he, he went through and told me about all the campaigns that the team were doing. Uh, and, you know, the Swedish team had a lot of, you know, a lot of activities going. So it wasn't lack of, you know, they were really trying. So they had tons of things ongoing. Okay. So I said, well, well, thank you for calling, and, but I need to think about this. And I did. I thought about it for a week. I called my dad, I called other, some other people. But after a week, I, I called back and I said, Olav, you know what? Yes, I would be interested in takeover uh, Sweden under one circumstance. And he said, OK, so now it's just his turn to sort of, OK, so under what circumstance are you ready to take over Sweden? Well, I said, I'll take, I'll take this challenge if you give me six months where we're not going to talk about results. Any one of you know Olav? <laughs> Do you know, can you just feel the reaction on the other side of the line here? But maybe it was because no, not so many people was lining up to take over. I don't know. Uh, so, I mean, he thought about it for a while. And then he said, OK, Jesper, um, <laughs> OK, we'll take it. But I won't give you six months. I'll give you four, OK? And I'll come back to 
why I needed those four months. So there I was, I took the job. Best thing I've ever did, by the way. So, but why is it important to get some time when you're not focusing on results? Well, it's sort of like if you want to see the black dots in this picture, you got to look somewhere else. If you try to see the black dots, they will go away. <laughs> Same thing is with results. If you go in there and say, I'm going to change results here, that's not going to work. It's actually going to be just like the dots here in the picture. Nothing starts with results. Everything starts with people. Okay? And there's a certain, some things that I've picked up on people over the years um, that I want to share with you because if everything starts with people, I think it's important that we, we think hard about this. What is it so special with people? Well, one, the, the number one thing I think is people are very different. Okay, people don't exactly think like you do. I have three kids, and I have a beautiful wife, and on the odd occasion, when my, grand, when my parents will come, they actually will take over our three kids, and Maria and me get a night out on our own, okay? When I get that rare occasion, what is the one thing that comes into my mind? Beer. beer, yes, great, Friday night we can go to the pub and get a beer, maybe two, maybe three. Now, that is not the same situation in my wife's situation. She's thinking something completely different. <laughs> She's not even thinking beer at the end. It might be something else. So this is true for me and my wife, but it's also true for you as a leader when you come into teams. People will think different from what you think. And it's very important you take the time to get to know them. Second thing is, people have enormous power. And this is very true if you're wanting to become a leader. Because definition-wise, what is a leader? Well, it's actually someone doing something and people are willing to be led by him or her. Leadership, being led. And if you are not paying attention to that, and you're maybe rushing away into the result world too fast, you're going to be very lonely out there. And at the end, you might even fall down. So remember that. Trust your people. Third thing is, there's only two things in life that you can call a must. Okay? The one is, we must die one day. I'm sorry to say that, break the news to you, but it's sort of the consequence of living is that we one day, we must die. But the second must is, we must choose. So never come to me and say, Jesper, you must do this. Ola, try that in the beginning. And what happens is I say no. No, I'm not going to do it. I must not do it. But instead come to me and say, yes, but maybe we can think about this and discuss it so that you choose to do this. And then I might very well do exactly like you want. But as a leader, remember that there's only two musts in life. And it all choices, not circumstances, is what determines our success. So this is really important. And then we all align it into engagement. And here I say there's actually two types of engagement. There is sort of the positive engagement where people feel connected. And then there's actually another one, which is the negative engagement where people are afraid. And I suggest, and especially in the leadership house, it's about the positive engagement that we're here to talk about. But the thing I told you about results is that you can't focus on results if you want to achieve results. Same thing is with engagement. Marcus, I can't go up to you and say, Marcus, you've got to be more engaged. Is that going to make you more engaged? No. 
There's other things you have to do. Remember, you have to look outside of the picture in order to get to that engagement. And this is really what the leadership house is about. So, now I've started, and let's go back and now just get some, something straight. So, this is the engagement of the Swedish team when I started. Low engagement and, and high disengagement. Now, I'm going to do a little exercise with you all. Can you all picture, even if you have a team of 200, just say that you have a team of 10. Can you all do that picture? You have a team of 10. Regardless of how many people they are, they're 10, okay? You're there? Now, those 10 people are going to bike on a 10-seater bike. How will that look like? Something like this. Photoshop, very bad. But it's 10 people on a bike, okay? Now, the bike is going somewhere. And I put up there the color codes are basically the engagement score of the Swedish team when I started. So in essence, what we had then was a 10-seater bike and two people were biking ahead, mm, trying really hard. Then you had one person just sitting on the bike. Mm. But then you had, in the red there, you had seven people braking. Mm. So how far do you think this bike will go? And then how do you feel those set two people in the front there, are they going to be tired or are they going to be frustrated? They might even go away because biking on this 10-seater bike is not so much fun, okay? I come back to this slide. Now, um, I got four months and I just want to share this with you. This is basically how it looked like after four months. And I, was, I, was, I knew that Ola was getting closer of making that phone call. It's like, how is it going? <laughs> now it's time to talk about results. And um, it, it, it's really sort of, am I doing the right thing? Because as you can see, the green line was actually doing a little bit better, but not really improving, okay? And at that time, four months into it, you feel sort of like, oh, Man, is this right? But I kept on focusing on the bike. I said, you know, if we can get this bike to go faster ahead and get more people on board, it's got to change. Have to. And a year later, Geos came. Now, same team, same people. Engagement is now up at 75%. But more importantly, disengagement is down to zero. Let's go back to the bike. That means instead of having two people in the front biking, we now had close to eight. Eight people biking. And we actually had two people just sitting on the bike, and no one was braking. That's fantastic, isn't it? And what? Yeah. Oh. But what will happen to results then? Well, this was it uh, I showed you. Actually, since August 2012, four months into it, more or less, we've been growing every month. Same market, same people, selling the same product. So engagement and the positive engagement can really make a huge impact. So what I want to share with you today is building the leadership house. And I asked my five-year-old daughter, Alice, to draw a house. So if there's anything you will remember from today, is Alice's house, okay? So thank you, Alice. But that house, again, is a metaphor for a place where you as a leader, you build it together with your team. You know, you're not really fully responsible. You're, you're accountable for it together with your whole team. But the what, important thing is results will happen outside of the house. It's sort of a consequence. It's the output of the things you do in the house. And in the house, you have sort of engagement happening. All right? But in order for you to get to that engagement, the positive engagement, the connectedness of people, there's other things you need to focus on as a leader. And this is what I'll go through with you today. Sounds interesting? Are you with me still? Even after it's lunch? Good. So the first thing is the foundation. And Marcel, you build a house. 
And anyone who's built a house know that the most important thing when you're building a house is the foundation. What is it in the foundation? Well, here you build trust. And we'll come, we'll talk a little bit about what that means. But trust is really important if you're going to build a really functional leadership house. Then it's about the why. And this is the purpose with a big P. It's making a difference or putting a dent in the universe, if you like. And again, everyone in your team needs to share that why. Then you build joy. And I actually say it's two different types of joy that you need to pay attention to. First you have joy at work, or fun at work, but more importantly is joy in work, fun in work. And that in relates to the purpose with a big P, and it's how each individual in your team actually feel that they are contributing to that purpose. Joy in work. And the last piece is, is building the roof of the house, and that relates to focus and creativity. Okay, so let's get going. The leadership house. Building trust. And yes, I'll be honest with you, trust is not something you can do over a day. Trust is not a quick fix. And of course, it's true also in the Swedish team. So there are, it takes time to build trust, and it's important that you do it long term. But very importantly is that you as a leader understand you have to find a way to address the fears that are in your team. I only have 45 minutes here today, so I won't be able to explain to you the language that we have in Sweden. But if anyone is interested about it, uh, then I'm happy to share it afterwards. But this is really an understanding of the five aspects that we all operate in. in. And this gives you a language, a, a way to explain and talk about fears together as a team. And that will help you overcome them. And sort of that is really a key to building trust over time. I had four months. So what I could do on those four months was actually spend time with my team. Okay? At the time, it was about 20 people in the Swedish team. So actually, with four months, I could spend one day with each and every one in the team. Now, when I do these presentations, there are sometimes it's even, you know, for example, look, you have much more than 20 people around you, so of course this is going to be very hard to spend a one day with each and every one of us. But almost every leader has about 20 people that they are interacting with on a daily basis. And I say, start there. That's where you need to build sort of the trust. I, I could do it with everyone in the team. And one of the things that happened when I was there is, you know, when I listened, and this is key, over a day you start to talk about all kinds of things. Again, I didn't have an agenda, you know, it was sort of, you know, I would just spend the day with you. So we, we met customers, we did all kinds of things. But all the time, at some point, we came into talking about our products. And what I discovered then was that everyone in my team said that our competitors were much better than us. And I say this because here, as a leader, you've got to understand the importance of shut up. Because it's so easy that we go in and start defending. But if you want to build trust, it's very important, more important than you know, defending and saying that we're much better, is to listen and actively listen because that is how they feel. And if trust is what you want to build, it's important that you listen. Then it's about authenticity. Because at some point, when you're a leader, you need to start address your team. And when you do, you address them as it is. You're authentic. Don't paint an overly optimistic picture. If you don't believe it is an overly optimistic future ahead of us, don't say it like that. Say it like it is. Be authentic. Don't know how many of you have read Lord Shackleton and his journey down to the South Pole. The book is called The Endeavor, and it's a great 
leadership story. If anyone has the time to read it, do it. It's fantastic. But it speaks to authenticity. This is, a, is an ad Lord Shackleton put into the Times in 1913 when he was looking for men to go with him on this journey. It took them two and a half years. The ship froze on the ice there, and they were stuck on the ice for two and a half years. But Lord Shackleton got every single man back alive. So, really amazing story. But when he was looking for men to go with him, this is what he said. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long month of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. He was authentic. He got the men sort of capable of doing it, but he said it like it was going to be. And last but not least, you got to get rid of prestige. Okay, now I, I, I would like to introduce a little competition with you all. Okay, so can you all stand up? All right, stand up. Now, can you face uh, someone next to you and shake his or her hand? And while shaking, stop. When you're shaking, stop there. Right, now I would like you to lift your hand like this. Up, get your thumb up like this, can you? So you sort of can start to push, all right? <laughs> now the competition is the following. All right, your idea is to get your hand on your opponent's shoulder for as many times as possible. And of course, <laughs> the other thing is true. The other one is gonna do the same thing. I'll give you 15 seconds and the winner is whoever gets to do that most times, okay? So, uh, get set, go! All right, okay, 15 seconds up. How many managed to do zero? Oh, there's some truthful people here. How many managed to do one? How many did five? How many did 15? <laughs> Excellent, that's super. So, uh, well, then you know, but I'll, Mars, if someone volunteering up here can come up and show how we can do this even 25 times in 15 seconds. Oh, okay, okay, Marcel, you can. So this is how you can do it. Get set, go. <laughs> All right, give them a hand. <laughs> Excellent. The trick is to get rid of prestige. It's to get people to cooperate. And yes, Anshul, that means we might rethink our incentive structures. <laughs> <laughs> it might mean that the performance rating reviews, etc., might have to go away. Because if you are wanting to build engagement and positive engagement, team spirit and cooperation is key. Okay? All right, so I told you, results will happen as a consequence of something else and engagement in the house. Now we've talked about trust. Now it's time to move into the why. And I already said, the why is about the purpose, how we make a difference, a dent in the universe. And this is, of course, very important if you want to connect to the positive engagement, because most of us want to go up in the morning and make a difference. One of the things that happened to me when I started in April 2012 was that I actually went out and met a lot of people. And I asked each and every one of them I met about who is our customer? And can you tell, can you describe the vision for diabetes care? And one of the things that happened here was that I got all kinds of answers, but really no consistency. We had tons of customers apparently, and we really had a lot of different visions. And this was also true for my team. So, by the end of May or something, I got everyone together, the whole team, everyone, in a two-day workshop in a really nice conference facility outside Stockholm. And I said, all right, we have two days. We have one set of questions. 
And if we can do this in two hours, we have two days to really enjoy this conference facility. So I was building in some positive incentives here. But the first question is, for whom? Then it's why are we going to do what? Okay? How long do you think it took us to agree on the first question? <laughs> Two days. Mary, you've heard this before. Yes, it's actually true. Um, I, at the end of the first day, I had to introduce this sort of follow-up question. You know, who would really miss us if we disappear? If we believe in what we're doing, would it be the nurse? Would it be the doctor? It might be a free lunch they miss. But in reality, if we believe in what we're doing, people with diabetes and their families, they will miss us if we disappear. Okay? So we agree on that. So people with diabetes, that's, and, and we've heard that in the morning. So now this is all sort of common knowledge, but this was very important for the, the journey in the leadership house in Sweden. Now, when you have that, it's time to take a look at the why. Okay, so if it's for people with diabetes that we're here for, why? What are we going to do for them? And when companies are founded, the why is usually very present. Okay? It's very close. But as companies grow, we tend to go further and further away from that why. And you notice that when you ask someone, can you tell me your company's vision? Okay? If you ever, now from this day on, if you ever see or hear someone say, our vision is to become number one, our vision is to become the best, our vision is to become market leader, what questions are they answering? They're answering what is good for our company. It's great for our company if we're market leaders, you know. It's not necessarily great for people with diabetes. We don't know that, but, you know, we sort of hope. But it's definitely good for us if we're market leaders. But the important question, if you want to connect to the engagement in the meaning of people, is to answer the second question. What is our company good for? This is what's touching the heart here. Okay? And therefore, a vision can be very inclusive. It can be very broad. You can, you can share it with ma many people. All right? So finding why is not a process of discovery. No, it's a process of discovery, not invention. Meaning, you don't put a senior executive in a room for two days and say, invent a new vision. Instead, you look into yourself. You look into what you're doing as a company and how you make a difference. And you'll find it in the DNA of your company. That's where the why exists. And one of the persons I met that first month was Severin, and this is what Severin said. And I felt, well, you know, now we're getting somewhere. So going back to the team, we said, now let's use Simon Sinek's sort of... Uh, he has a target, and you see that here on me here? A target. It looks like this. So from there, from whom, the outside in, you go into the center of the circle, which is the why. And from the why, you work yourself out to the how, and then eventually to the what. Okay? So in April then, end of April in 2012, this is what our team came up with as our why. We're here for people with diabetes, and our why is to enable them to live life as unrestricted as possible. And I think that links very nicely to the vision we have today. The how, how do we make this possible? Well, one of the things we did when we had discovered that it was people with diabetes that were our customers was that we went out and we talked to a lot of customers. We talked to them. Didn't do market research, I want to be clear here. We just talked. How is it to have diabetes? And one of the things we found out was that having diabetes is, you know, they're really focused. If you are, sort of, we heard that this morning, if you are well, if you are not having diabetes or any chronic disease, you can be, your brain is full of all kinds of things. 
But when you have that, and especially when it happens to you, you get very focused. You want control. I'm gonna, you've got to change your life. You've got to change it for the rest of your life. So in our how, we said, all right, so how do we help people live life as unrestricted as possible? Well, we do it by helping them get enough control of their diabetes and support them in changing behaviors over time. I think enough control is key. If you talk to people with diabetes, they don't really want to know all the time. They want to have some, some free times, but they want to know for the long term, I mean, how they can live in order for them to live very long, unrestricted lives, and change support behavior, changing behaviors. I mean, we are in the business of changing behaviors. Think about it. Yes, we provide them with test results and, you know, pump and other things that gives insulin, but really, they have to change their behaviors for the rest of their lives. And we can be with them on that journey. And we heard about eminence. We heard about connect. I mean, the future, I'm sure, lies in this changing behavior part. And here we can make a difference. And then you come to the what? And here, you know, what we do, we innovate and d develop solutions and programs like mobile, eminence, Bolus Cal studies, et cetera, et cetera. And then you can put it together. And then you can put it on the wall in your office so that everyone can see this. So it's very transparent. Regardless of who you are, what role you play in the team, we all know exactly why we're here and how we can make a difference to the what we do. To put it in perspective, I, uh, I want to share with you a story, a really famous story that I'm sure that most of you have heard. But the story is about John F. Kennedy and a speech he makes, first in a university on the East Coast, and then he makes it to Congress in September, I think it is, in 1961. And where he says, before the end of this decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. All right, in the circle, where is Kennedy right now? Where is Kennedy? I mean, this is a famous, famous quote, and it, it's really, you know, you talk about it in gold settings. If you go to these smart gold courses, etc., you know, they always bring this up. But really, it's an it's, it's a extremely smart goal got all the in ingredients of a goal setting, but it's in the what side. What we are going to do is we're going to put a man on the moon. We're going to put it before the end of this decade, so we even know in time when we have the cutoff. Okay. To understand this, we also have to know the context of why he said it. Okay. And when he said it was 1961, what happened in 1961? We had the Cold War. Since World War II, we have had basically the winners of World War II, and they, it was you know, sort of the, the east to the west, okay? Where you had sort of the west representing by US here, and then you had Russia and, uh, and, the, and the, you know, the communist side, okay? And in the Cold War, there was a battle. And that battle was battle for space, okay? But now, let's think about it from, from the circle model. For whom was Kennedy addressing that day at Congress in 1961? Who was he addressing? The people. The people, yes. Not just Americans. I say he was addressing everyone living on this planet. Why? Well, Kennedy was passionate about believing in democracy and believing that democracy is a superior governmental system than communism. I'm not going to go into you know, arguments here, but this is what he was passionate about. Now, how can I show that democracy is better than communism for everyone living on the planet? <coughs> By making the impossible possible first. So in order for us to do this, what do we need to do? Well. Before the end of this decade, we're going to put a man on the moon. See this? And there's a follow-up story to this, and it's um, a couple of months later, after he was given this speech, Kennedy is supposed to have gone to an uh, airbase to speak to the troops. Okay? 
probably a story because it says Kennedy gets lost. Presidents don't get lost. I mean, you know, they, they don't do that. So it's probably a story, but it really links to what I'm trying to say here. So Kennedy is lost on this airbase. So he walks around and looking for the team. And suddenly he comes to the door and he opens the door and there's a big room, a hangar. And you see some planes in the back, but in the middle of the floor is a man sweeping the floor. So Kennedy goes out to the man and he says, Private, what are you doing? And the man looks up and says, Mr. President, I'm putting a man on the moon. Now here's the power. The air base is part of NASA, who's part of the air program that's actually going to put a man on the moon before the end of this decade. This man fits in. That's, he is knowing his place in the universe. Sweeping that floor is a central part of making this happen. Do you see how powerful it can be when you connect? Okay? You get even down, it, regardless of your role. And that's the key. Regardless of your role in your team, you play an important part. So if we do that for us, so, you know, we're here for people with diabetes and their families. And we know that when you talk to people with diabetes, especially with kids, you know, kids that get diabetes, you usually talk to their families. But everyone gets involved when someone gets diabetes. Why? Well, we want their lives to be as unrestricted as possible. How we make this happen is to give them enough control over their diabetes and support in changing behaviors over time. And then you come to the what? We innovate and develop solutions and programs like mobile, expert, eminence, etc. So you start from the why and you work yourself out. And that's how you build the connectedness, the engagement. So now we're coming to this side of the house, which relates to joy. And I told you there's two different types of joy or, hap or fun. There's fun in work and fun at work. Now, let's see. First of all, why is joy so important? I think John Lennon has nailed it. When I was five years old, my mother always told me that happiness was the key to life. When, when, when I went to school, they asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up. I wrote down happy. They told me I didn't understand the assignment. I told them they didn't understand life. So of course it's important that we bring happiness or joy to work. And like I said, there's two different types of joy. At work and in work. Now, could you give me an example of at work? What could be a moment of fun at work? It could be looking out here, drinking coffee with your colleagues and looking at the Burj Khalifa. That's fun at work. We're here, we're working, we're looking out there and we're having a good time. It could be the Friday beer. Could be your kickoff conference. It's all kinds of moments in your work life where you have fun at work. But fun in work is something different. Fun in work is where you connect to the why. It's when you as a person and as an individual in your team are doing something so that you see how you contribute into the bigger why. And I call this purpose with a small p and compare that to the purpose with a big p, which is the, the big why. And in work are the stories you as a leader need to collect. And look, we talked about culture this morning. The, the, the in work happiness stories, those are the cultural bearers. Those are the campfire stories. And as a leader, you collect those because you want to have a lot of stories to share because that really builds purposeful meaning. And it also builds motivation. Now, I want you to picture that you are now one day working with me in Sweden and you're a sales rep, okay? And Sweden is a relatively long and vast country. I mean, you know, nothing compared to Brazil, but you know, still for, for Europe, it's, it's very long. So Today we're going up from Stockholm, we're going to drive all the way up to Sundsvall, which is a drive of about two and a half hour. So we go up six o'clock and we put ourselves in the car and we drive. We come to the meeting, it's 9.30 or so, and we start the meeting. After the meeting, 
it's about 10 o'clock. Any one of you been to Sweden at 10 o'clock? I know Jacob has, but anyone else? What happens in Sweden at 10 o'clock is we drink coffee. Okay, we call it fika. Okay? I guess the reason why we fika at 10 and 3 is because it's very dark in Sweden and it's very cold, so we need to drink something warm. So anyway, you have had your meetings with your nurses and they ask you, do you want to join us for coffee? And we say yes. So we sit down and we drink coffee and we talk and it's really nice. I mean, the nurses have even made some really, really nice cinnamon buns here. So we're eating the cinnamon buns. Mm, great. And we're talking about all kinds of things. What are we experiencing right there? We're having fun at work. Technically, we're still working, but we're drinking coffee and we're talking about all kinds of things. We're fun at work. Suddenly, conversation changed. It goes down and we start talking about Peter. Peter is 35, has had diabetes since he was 15, and he's not paying attention to himself. Nurses are very worried about Peter because his blood sugar levels are going like this and you know he's probably gonna suffer because he's not paying attention to himself but now last time you were here you had that mobile around your neck and you know what we gave mobile to Peter and he loves it absolutely loves it and now he's testing himself and he's got superb control of his blood sugar it's great it's fantastic at that moment, what is it that I'm experiencing right now? That's joy in work. You know, that's the reason why I go up in the morning and drive. That's why I put myself there, okay? So those are the moments that are relating to joy in work, and they are very important. Okay, so this is the house. The last part of the house is focus and creativity. And why is this important? Well, because especially if it's hard times, you know, if things are going sort of, it's rough, you need to be creative and you need to have a clear focus. It will help you and it will s help you through hard times. And I told you about Olaf when he explained the different uh, products we had uh, and we were doing all kinds of product campaigns, etc. When we met in August, I told the team in August 2012, I told the team, okay, now, of all the products and all the campaigns we're doing, what are the products that we should focus on? So we decided to focus on two. Mobile and remote control pump combo. Okay, so why mobile? Well, if you think about it, mobile is really, if our why is to enable for people with diabetes to live their life as unrestricted as possible, there's no better product positioning us right there. I mean, mobile, you can test yourself almost everywhere you go, if you hold it right. You can test yourself <laughs> anywhere. And it's really making life more unrestricted. So it makes sense. I mean, that's a, that's a product that will help us position our why on the market. That's why you have mobile around your neck. And we had launched mobile in Sweden in 2009, way before my time. And when we were at, uh, in the beginning of 2012, we had been able to move our market share of mobile up to about 1%. From 2009 to 2012, we had 1%. After we met in August, when we decided on, yeah, well, now we're going to focus on mobile, something happened. And any one of you who's been in business school knows that there's this chosen truth that you know, when you have launched a product, you can't change the trajectory of the curve after six months after launch. Have you heard that chosen truth? So whatever you, you have the, the line where it's going that way, it's going to continue to go that way for the rest of the product cycle. Well, we can prove them wrong. So this is just, you know, this is where we've been going with mobile, selling for about 15,000 uh, a day. After we met in August, boom, something happened. It started flying. And it didn't just continue in 2013. In 2014, we continued to grow by 50%. So having focus on the why really helps you when you are focusing on the things you're going to do. 
People don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. And then you had the remote control pump combo. And here's another true story. Um, I had one of the reps in the South Sweden, she calls me up in September and she says, Jesper, I've been really excited about all the things that we've done so far, so therefore I'm going to do something different. I'm going to go to a clinic in the South where we've never sold a pump before, okay, Medtronic clinic. And I said, okay, great, so what are you going to do? And then she sort of, mm, uh, I tell you later. Again, trust. And it wasn't like we had sold anything there before, so, you know, it wasn't much to lose there. So I said, okay, all right, go ahead, call me when you're done. <coughs> Two hours later, get a phone, I get a phone call, and it's her. And she said, I sold two pumps! <gasps> Fantastic! How did you do that? And she said, well, you know, it was September, I was going in there to the meeting and like wearing my summer dress and, you know, it was three nurses and two doctors, all female, and I started the meeting. Halfway through, I stopped and I said, you know what, I felt I, I had to do something because as you know, I'm a diabetic myself and I have a pump and therefore I had to give myself some more insulin. And the nurses said, no, you didn't. We didn't see you do anything. Doctors nod their heads and no, we didn't see anything. And she said, well, that's interesting, because maybe you thought I was doing something else when I was fiddling around in my purse, but actually I was using my remote control to give myself some more insulin. Did she get the sales there? Ralph, did she get the sales there? So. You think so? Well, but I think she got the interest. So they clearly got interested. She didn't get a sale, but now this is how she got the sale. Because she said, well, it's very, very interesting that you said you didn't see me do it. Because I'm pretty sure you would have if I hadn't had the remote control. Because then I would have to do this. When she bends down and lifts her dress all the way up here and she has the pump under her bra. Remember, this is Sweden. Might not work everywhere, but it worked in Sweden. She said, because then I would have to do this. At that moment, it clicked. You know, you have two teenage girls coming in tomorrow. You, they cannot wear whatever clothes they want. Their life is restricting them. And their diabetes is restricting them. Therefore, by having a remote control, they can live life more unrestricted. And we have continued to sell a lot of pumps in that clinic. So it really works. So today you've heard about the Leadership House. And I hope it's sort of inspiring you to think a little different and think about this house as a place you build together with your team. It's a virtual house, it's not necessarily the office, but it's a place where you and your team want to go to, not because you have to, but because you want to. And it can be very profitable. When we closed the books in 2013, same people, same products, operating on the same market, our operating profit versus what was expected in those business plans that Olaf showed me when I started, we had improved by 85%. Pretty amazing. So let's go back to Henry V and that battle, all right? And this is what Shakespeare writes. This story shall the good man teach his son, and Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by. From this day to the ending of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. And Henry won. And the Battle of Agincourt is today, 600 years later, still remembered, still taught in schools, still talked about even here today in Dubai. Now I think if Henry would have acted like most modern business leaders, if he would have been like me coming straight out of business school, he would have focused on the numbers. He would have counted the men, he would have counted the horses, he would have done the math. 6,000 English, 30,000 French, outnumbered five to one, hmm and he would have lost, but he didn't. Instead, he listened. 
Actually, the story here goes that Henry actually goes into the camp in disguise so that they don't even know it's him. And he talks to his people. And then he also addresses them. He put the numbers, the output, the results aside. He walked around the camp in disguise and he listened. And he gained the trust of his people. He gave them a why. Not for me, not for you, for England. He made them proud and happy to be part of a campaign that would be remembered for centuries. Joy. And then he got, he changed the rules. Now, focus and creativity. The old rule said, put your cavalry and men at arms in the front and your archers and your crossbows in the back. Henry did the opposite. Be creative here. He put the archers in the front. And the effect was devastating. Arrows rained over the French army, reducing it to chaos. And Henry won, outnumbered five to one. But what's important here is not the military tactics or the battle history. What is important is what we might learn from it. And I think the simple lesson is this. If you want to change something, you can't begin with the results, win the war, or increase your sales. You can't begin with the output. You have to begin with the input. Because at the end of the day, businesses are not made of numbers and spreadsheets. They're made out of people. Nothing begins with results. Everything begins with people. Thank you. So thanks a lot, Jesper, for this motivational, inspirational, and also entertaining speech. The last time I heard you with this sort of speech, I had to wear for one year an orange mobile sock around my neck. So I got a little bit nervous when I saw you with a target, and my bosses are sitting here in the room. We'll meet again.